Jose, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Jan. Thanks for having me. Now, you have a very, very interesting story. You are a millennial CEO of a traditional tier one automotive company. And we're going to tear into that and find out about your leadership style and your challenges. But first, let's go back. Where were you born? I was actually born in Harlingen, Texas, a small town. Very, very small town. And then college? College, I ended up doing most of my early life in Monterey, Mexico, border with Texas. So college, I actually graduated from one of the top three colleges, best colleges in Latin America. What'd you study? Business, engineering, and IT major. Oh, well, that's certainly a good background to have for what's happening in the industry right now. Yeah, and that's actually when I started going to other paths and be creative because I was the first generation of that college to graduate from that major. They created that career specifically for the upcoming challenges. And I decided just to jump on board and because business and IT and engineering doesn't sound like it goes along. But it sounds fancy, definitely. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it certainly does now. In the age of technology that we're in, you couldn't have picked a better major, I wouldn't have thought. <laughs> but then, so now, so you come out of college, you're probably, you know, young and ready to take on the world. So how did you do that? How did you take on the world after college? So right away, I enter with British American Tobacco as an analyst, very huge company, highly recognized Um uh, I decided after a couple of years, it wasn't just for me. I didn't felt like I had a voice or, or the impact that I wanted to do in the company. So after that, I decided to enter London Consulting Group, um, travel the world, six different countries. I did analyze more than 10 different industries. So it was a very high paced environment. I used to go into the company three weeks, tell them what's wrong, fix it in six months, next challenge, next challenge. And, and that's when I started liking it, the, 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 the challenges and, and just not being working in the same environment and the same routine, right? I, I, I do think I'm a very creative guy and I like thinking and challenging and different stuff. So after all the traveling, at first, it's very exciting. You're on the plane. You're very happy. After some time, it, it gets tiring and you get old as well. So. <laughs> yeah. Now, I believe that there's a skill set in this ability to assimilate into different company cultures. And consultants certainly do that because they have to, right? They have to assimilate into the culture, understand very quickly what's going on, take the pulse of the organization and come up with their proposals or recommendations. Do you think that that experience, that skill set that you learned how to assimilate into these different industries as well as different companies do you think that that helped set you up to be the leader that you are today? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That background that consulting gave me, it gives you the whole picture, as you said it. And now, especially now that we're working so hard towards diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, working with different cultures, different mindsets, different approaches definitely gave me all the strengths that I needed to be the leader that I am today. So what happened after consulting? So you come off all this global travel, you've got all this experience, now what? Well, that that's a great question. I had three final offers that I was trying to debate. Uh, one in a bigger retailer, the biggest retailer company in the world, uh, down in Mexico City. I had another one in my hometown, Monterey, Mexico, where I spent most of my early life. And the last one, I had one for a small, medium company down here in Rochester Hills, Michigan. So I started doing my due diligence. People didn't like that I was pro-Detroit at that point because a lot of bad things were happening in Detroit, bank room, bank room C, uh, capital more city of the world. But I, as I said, I like the challenges. I like moving the needle. I, I, I like leaving a footprint. So I decided by choice to come to Detroit. And I'm very proud to say that now I feel like an adopted Detroiter. I and love Detroit. Uh, that's good to hear. And tell us about the company that you picked and why. 
It was a very different company. It's called Industrial Automation. Uh, we used to do all the automation equip equipment assembly lines for the tier ones. So sunroof lines, fascia lines, all the automation for, 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 for the parts of the car. So it was very interesting because every single project was different. We had to design the machines, build it, program them, tear them down, go to the customer, set them up, and run them. And, you know, the runoff with 300, 1,000 parts to make sure it has repeatability and everything. So I, I picked this company. I was very excited. And actually, I did make the right choice because that's when my career skyrocketed it into the executive roles. Mm. And now here you are today. You have been in the position of CEO of Anchor Automotive for a year. Yes, one year, four days, actually. Yeah, so. but who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> who's counting, you're right. <laughs> so there's got to be a story there, Jose. How, how on earth did that happen? How does a traditional tier one company, and please share with us a little bit more about what Anchor does, but how does a company like that pick a millennial CEO? Tell us about that process. So Anchor Automotive, it's the leading tier one in software automotive solutions and all the label solutions for the cars. So nobody thinks about labels, but the car has more than 30 labels that they need to actually get into the road. The window sticker for the dealership, the tire tread pressure for you to know the, the pressure on the tires, the certificate of the vehicle, very complex. So we're the leading tier one software and label solutions company. We have been around for 40 years. This is our 40th anniversary. So we're very excited to celebrate this huge milestone. And I'm the third CEO of the company. The only millennial one, as you said it. <laughs> it it was it was a very nice challenge. Actually, my negotiation went for four or five months. Uh, when we started for the initial conversations, as I said, in my previous company, I skyrocketed it. In five years, I had more than four different positions because after a year or a couple of months, like any millennial, I want more. I want something different. I'm done here, right? Give me more. Next challenge. So my next natural career step was obviously the CEO role. I, I was already in charge of the operations in, in that previous company. Uh, internationally wise, we had four facilities. So we started conversations with Anchor Automotive. Uh, the previous CEO was about to retire here. So he actually, after they hired me, I, I told him, like, why me? You know, and he had two options, a traditional CEO with a lot of experience, more than 15, 20 years in the automotive industry, or, my, or myself that I only had five automotive industry years in that at, at, at that time, but he saw something different. And my speech was, I want to take Anchor Automotive to the next level. Why settle on labels? Let's do software. Let's sell software solutions. Now the cars with the e-mobility are like a huge iPad. And every, all the cars now have software. Why don't we tap in into that opportunity with all the new EV companies coming to the race? That's a huge opportunity. So my sales pitch actually attracted the previous uh, CEO and also the board because the board also interviewed me, right? Because they, they were like, okay, why a 34-year-old should be the CEO of a 40-year-old company, right? Well, I credit them. I mean, I really do. Kudos to them. Because most companies would have gone for the traditional tier one, tier two CEO with, you know, decades of experience. And I, I really, I mean, tremendous move on their part to put you in this role. I want to go back to something that you just said. You said, as you were moving up the ranks in your last company, you said, typical millennial, I wanted more and more. I wanted a challenge. And I just had this exact conversation with one of my clients earlier this week. And there is a bit of a reluctance in traditional automotive to give more responsibility to younger people, you know, millennials, are, and now really it's Gen Z, because there's this thinking that they don't have the experience, you know, they might fail right? And they're just not ready. I, I can't tell you how many 
times I've worked for companies where they say, oh, no, you know, you've got to do your time. If I wanted to promote a millennial, they would say, no, 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 they got to be in that role for five years before they move to the next role, because maybe that was the model that they grew up in. But that will not fly anymore. And my message to my client was empower your Gen Zs, give them more responsibility. Will they fail? Is there a chance that they'll fail? Yeah, of course there is. Anybody can fail at anything. But this tremendous fear that we have of failure and that it will somehow come back on us prevents us from trusting and coaching and giving that safe environment for millennials and Gen Z to thrive. But if we don't do it, Jose, they're going to leave, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you just said it, like, we need to create a safe environment for them to be able to fail. Because failing will provide the lessons learned, but also the trust for them to take risk and feel empowered, right? 40% of the CEOs, US wide, we agree that if we don't change or we don't change our current strategy, or 10 year plan, we will fail. Because today we need to adapt and we need to pivot. And we need to work with these new generations. Uh, millennials are 35% of the working force in the US. Gen Z's are only 5% now, but they're coming. And these two generations are looking for something totally different than the traditional leadership model. And it goes right to the heart of innovation. As we all know, innovation, by definition, you try and you fail and you iterate. We cannot have innovation if we have fear of failure in the air. If, if we're paralyzed because we're so afraid to make a mistake, then we're, we're never going to innovate because nobody's ever going to step out and take a risk and try something different. So with your background, what are you doing differently at Anchor? that will help promote this environment and encourage innovation and get the ideas and the buy-in from different generations? Because you, you need the input from the seasoned old-timers as well as the Gen Z and the millennial. So what are you doing, Jose? Tell us. I think there's two different challenges with the old-timers. You need to earn their trust and their respect, and that's just by leading with example and showing the results, right? But for millennials and Gen Z's, it's a whole different story. You need to build and give them a sense of purpose. Why should I belong to that company? What are those company values? What are their visions? You actually need to convince them to come and work with you, right? And what I'm doing at Anchor, it's building trust if my team doesn't trust me and I don't trust them, they won't give me ideas to innovate, right? So empowerment to create ideas. And something that we're actually doing that I'm looking forward to is 511, we're opening this innovation hub, which is a huge milestone for the company because we have been traditional for 40 years. And now we're opening an innovation hub that will actually take those ideas that we empower as leaders and make them a reality. Okay, I'm not gonna let you go on that one. We're gonna go deeper. What exactly is an innovation hub and how does it work? So the innovation hub, it's a room that will create 10%, 12% more of my organizational structure jobs, a high tech talent, attract talent to the region because we know that's a challenge right now. But also, that room is, there's no bad ideas. It might be a penny, a dollar idea, or a million dollar idea, but everything counts. So that room, it's the safe zone for everyone to fail, a safe environment for everyone to fail, but also be encouraged to think out of the box and address our current customers' pain points. How can we make their lives easier? So we'll have this huge event. It's a co-working space. Something that I'm also doing is working on the company culture. We actually call it culture, C-O-O-L-T-U-R-E. Mm -hmm. Culture, right? Love it. Uh, 
so yeah, that that's basically what the innovation hub is. We're trying to pivot as a company because we do labels, but eventually that product might go away. So we need to adapt and help this immobility race, right? Yeah. This now the innovation hub, I get that it's a separate area, but you can't just launch an innovation hub tomorrow and say to people, Oh, it's an innovation hub. Walk in and use your ideas. Tell us more about the process behind that. How does the process work? So once we started shifting the the company culture and working on the DE and I, we started pivoting our business, creating new solutions, right? But we didn't have a spot or or or, or the root place for 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 that idea. We used to get meetings, brainstorm but we didn't really have that collaboration space that we can really sit down there and say like, okay, guys, let's do this. What are the pain points? How are we going to fix it? So actually I did change the organizational structure and I did create a whole innovation area, which is going to be in charge of of that hub. I have my director of innovation and technology with the innovation developers that I'm going to hire right now. Uh, but 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 as as you said, it's a mid long term process. It's not like let's build it, let's do it. It, it, it. There there's a background and a purpose to it. And also, I'm using the innovation hub to try to attract those millennials and Gen Zs to the company. Yeah, I, the fact that you you have an area and you have people leading that part of the business and it's designed to pull out those ideas from an organization that's 40 years old. Uh, That's a a huge, huge step forward. Yeah, I even remember some months ago, the first time we sold a different product that we created from scratch, customer had a pain point, We, we made it happen, we sold it. We were very happy because that was the first step towards and the new towards the new anchor automotive and that's when people started believing because my turnaround and my 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 turnaround is very low and the tenure that i have in my company it's so high jen the people that leave is because they're actually retiring so i have people the average people here have been for more than 20 years so and they're used to just do the same and do the same and here comes this new John guy that wants to create stuff and pivot and change what is he doing so it 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 was a fun ride actually I feel like right now everyone is on the same page and that's why you need to be very diligent about the vision and purpose for everyone to understand where do we want to go as a company right But tell me more about that I mean I I could just imagine you, if I was an employee of Anchor and I'd worked there for over 20 years and here's this uh, new CEO coming in and you walk through the door and here's this young guy, probably the same age as one of my kids, right, that walks walks through the door, uh, they're the boss. How did you earn their trust? How did you deal with some of it? There has to be some eye rolling going on there and some side conversations and you've got to prove yourself. How how does that? How did that work? You. It wasn't definitely by sitting on my desk. Every morning, I go out there, I say hi, I remember the names. So people feel close and feel that I'm a very approachable guy. And also, I'm a very technical working CEO. I get into the nitty gritty. If a machine breaks, I'm there watching it, trying to fix it by myself. If we're shorthanded, I'll go there and help. So that I, I I think that earn the respect for the people that have long tenure here by by leading by example, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not just here on my fancy office typing, having coffee. I'm there with you on the trenches, making it happen, right? Yeah, I love that. I love that. Did you make a couple of missteps along the way? No, no, not really. I I don't know if it was by luck or something, but no, not really. I mean, people were not happy at the beginning because we were, I I, I was pushing them out of their comfort zone. And and that's part of my leadership as well. I want to take everyone to the next level, educationally wise and in in, in their career path. So my, I challenge people a lot and people that have been here for too many years don't necessarily like that, right? Mm -hmm. For example, okay, you you masterize 
fulfillment. Why don't you go now and run the PK machine? Well, because I've been fulfilling for 20 years. And I'm like, yeah, but you need to be cross-trained. You need to be able to do different stuff. And I'll reward you for it. I'll encourage you to do it, right? It, 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 will, it will get you more valuable, so. Okay, yeah, I, that had to be interesting. But you've been there a year now, so I, I'm imagining everybody's sort of settled into the new leadership and they're getting on board and they're all marching in the same direction. Yeah, definitely. When when I started, it took me a couple of months just to get our first new customer. We haven't had a customer, a new customer in a couple of years. So when I started bringing new customers, I brought six customers in, in the first five months of my of my career. So everyone was very excited. They were surprised. They, did, they didn't even knew how to do it. Like, new customer, how do we do that, <laughs> right? <laughs> to be a young CEO in a 40-year-old company, you have to be extremely comfortable with who you are, comfortable in your own skin. And yes, you, of course, are an authentic leader. But how did you develop that skill? How did you become so comfortable with your leadership skills so early on in life? Yeah. So as you said, it, it takes ironclad nerves to be in this position, especially when you're younger and you're dealing with, with, with executives that are way older than you and you're trying to do a price negotiation, escalation meetings. So it takes a lot of trust, but also something that helped me a lot in, in to, to become who am I right now is failure, right? Failing provide me all the lessons learned that I have applied to my new leadership style. And it's just about resilience, Jan. I mean, you don't need to, if you're afraid that you're going to fail, you're done. Like you're going to fail eventually. You're not perfect. What are you going to do with that failure? Are you going to be sad about it for the next couple of months and regret it? Or are you going to take it as a lesson learned and say like, okay, let's go again. Let's do it differently. This is what I learned. I won't do it again. Yeah. And I think in our industry is a lot of people we've been trained to that failure is a bad word, you know, and you can't fail whatever cost you can't fail. And to start to see failure as an opportunity for growth and an opportunity for learning is very different. And it's going to take us a while as an industry to really comprehend that. I uh, interviewed Daniel Pink, the author, and he wrote a book called The Power of Regret. And he says that the biggest regret people have is the regret of inaction, of not taking action. So yet we know this, but somehow fear paralyzes us and we're afraid to step out and make a decision or do something that's perhaps outside the norm because we're afraid that we're not going to be liked. We're afraid of judgment. We're afraid of making a mistake. So many different facets of fear that creep into our head that stops us from taking this, this action. What advice would you have to leaders out there in the auto industry today to help them encourage that kind of environment where people are not afraid to take action. So besides creating that safe environment for your team to fail, something that I do tell my managers and the people is that the failure is not an option phrase. It's gone. We should be aiming for excellence. So don't be afraid to fail, but all the time we should be aiming for excellence, but also don't be afraid of making decisions. You'll make some bad decisions, and when that happens, I'll be standing next to you, I'll be accountable for it, and we'll learn from it. But don't be afraid of making those decisions, because those decisions are the ones that are going to help you grow in your career. I think those are some of the most powerful words I've heard out of a leader. You just said, I'll be standing next to you. When you say that, the physical manif the the visual and the physical manifestation of that of somebody standing next to you, like arm in arm with you, no matter what, you go down, I'm going down with you. You rise, I rise too. We all rise. That's incredibly powerful. No, and 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 it's accountability. I'll be accountable. I'll take the hit for you. We we are a team. It's not you. It's me, right? So, and and that has helped me a lot because my managers don't hesitate to take decisions. And we have good ones and bad ones, but it's part of the process, you know, and the learning curve, so. Yeah. You've looked at the 21 traits of authentic leadership. Of all of those 21 traits, 
Give me the top two that resonate with you the most. As a millennial CEO, I want to know what are the top two and tell me why and how you practice them. Uh, that that was a tough one because out of the 20 ones, I think they're all great. Um, I'll say the first one is vision and purpose. Mm. That That's an important one for me. It's, be, it's all the storytelling. You need to inspire your people. You need your people to believe in the vision for you to keep moving forward, right? You need to be passionate enough about the vision and contagious enough for them to say like, Okay, let's do it, guys. Let's go out there and let's let's do it. Let's take it home, right? So that's my first one. And my second one, it's I, I mentioned it just a couple of minutes ago, it's resilience, right? Don't be afraid to fail. Take the failure and harvest from it. Take the lesson learned. Go out there and say, like, okay, I, I learned from the past, I learned from the mistake. Here we go. So I think those are my my top two. Yeah, let's go a little deeper on vision. Every tier one company out there has its vision stated on its website or it's on a nicely framed poster on a wall and maybe around the office. Some of those vision statements are pretty terrible in my mind. They, they say things like, oh, we're going to be the world-class manufacturer of this widget. Uh-huh. That doesn't inspire anyone. So crafting a vision for a company has got to come from the heart because you have to be able to not only believe it to the very core of your being and be able to tell stories around it and this is what it looks like and this is what it's going to feel like when we achieve this vision. But, you you know, you got a whole group of people that you got to get on board with this and it's got to come from the heart. It can't be pure corporate speak. How did you craft your vision for Anchor? Yeah, I, I like to keep it short and sweet. It's basically just three lines. Uh, and it goes like this. It says, we are the disruptors of the industry. We think out of the box. We take your headaches away with all our innovation and products. That's that's a brief summary. But I, I, I do emphasize on the on the word disruptive because disruptive in the past used to be a bad word. Yeah, right now, it did. I think right now disruptive is what we need. We need those game changers out there. We need people that are willing to take risks, think differently, raise their hands, challenge and say like, why don't we do it? Like we have A, B and C. Why don't we do it like D or like E, you know? See, and that's a very different vision statement than saying you're going to be the world-class manufacturer of labels in the auto industry and satisfy all stakeholders and create customer value, blah, blah, blah. That's it. I've seen yeah, multiple that's... versions of that statement, right? It doesn't mean <laughs> anything. What you just said, there's purpose behind that. Right, you're going to be disruptors. It says, it says, come on, come on board with me. Let's do this. Let's change this industry. And so you're going to attract those people that want to do that. You're not going to attract the people who just want to maintain, who just want to have a safe job, you know, maybe go in, do, do the work they got to do and leave. It, it's going to drive you to attract the people that you want to create the innovation that you want in the company. So I love that about it. What sort of feedback have you had on that vision so far? I think right now it's very positive, Jen, because everyone is rowing towards the same direction one year after. It was quite a fun ride, as I said. But right now, I think we're on point. All my executives, all my managers, all the teams are thinking. They know where to go because I, I'm a very communicative person. I do a lot of meetings. I go back there. I try to have one-on-ones to with the operators, with, with any type of level, just telling them what am I doing. I don't want them to think I'm just sitting down in my office now. So, for example, we do Q meetings where every executive reports out. We do this cool event. We, we report out, hey, this is what we're doing as a company. This is what we're celebrating. This is what we're not very proud of right now, but we, 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 we should change it and get better. So yeah, that's that's um, that's something that, that that I'm doing right now. I was I was reading a, a leadership article, and something that stick in my mind is 
how do you measure that your people have a sense of sense of purpose and they're happy on their place? And then I read the word KPI and I'm like, key performance indicators? No, not anymore. It's keep people informed, keep people inspired, and keep people interested. So those are the three ones that I like. That's my new KPI, right? I love that. I really like that because it goes a lot deeper and broader than just the metric itself. Yeah, and, and it's not a metric of people, but you know where your people are standing by asking those three questions. Are people inspired? Are they informed? And are they involved, right? So, I've interviewed a few millennial CEOs. Never a millennial CEO in a 40-year-old company, mostly startups. I've interviewed a Gen Z CEO who started up, a com- who um, launched a company called Prepared, which is fascinating stories, a Yale student. And I recently interviewed Jeremy McCool, who's the CEO of the EV wireless charging startup Hevo, and, and a few others along the way. And one thing I've noticed is that the mold of what you think a leader should be is very different. In fact, and I'm you have to answer this, but I'm going to give you my my take on it so far. I think that you don't really have a mold of what you think a leader should be. And when I grew up in the industry with my career, it was a very clear mold of what a leader should look like. I mean, typically it was a, it was a white male, but and it was you were you were meant to be tough. It was all about the numbers. Anything to do with people was considered soft stuff and quite frankly, bullshit. And it was just all about if it didn't impact the bottom line and you could not draw a direct line to the bottom line, then you didn't do it. It was aggressive and uh, it was a tough environment to grow up in. But the, the leaders, the mold of the CEO was very much in line with that type of leadership style, which of course is command and control. But I don't, I don't think millennials and Gen Z really have a mold that they're trying to fit. I mean, you tell me, do you? No, no. We actually create our mold or 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 change the shift of the mold as as we go. And that dictatorship leadership that you you just mentioned that doesn't work anymore. I mean, you can do it, but you won't have enough people in your company because nobody will want to work with you anymore. Right now, it's servant leadership, right? That that's the new style of leadership that 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 people are looking. Millennials and Gen Zs want a sense of purpose. They want to be inspired. They want work life balance. They they also want to be inclusive and work in a collaboration uh, environment. But they want to feel that the CEO or the executives are approachable to a personal level, because right now we have shift that leadership to actually know the persons you work with to a personal level so you can understand and if you understand them and you understand their needs they'll 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 be working along with you right servant leadership is as i said it working in the trenches with them and being an equal they they should be empowered enough to challenge your decisions because maybe they they have a million dollar idea that that you're not looking at yeah yeah and all most of my career, I was told you don't cross that line between professional and personal, and I think there's not there's not a line. Of course, you're not going to share every gory detail of your personal life at work, but you need to connect to people as human beings, and the way you connect is often by showing some vulnerability. And if things go wrong in your life, and it's something that you want to share, or at work, or you make a mistake. You're open about it and you show that level of vulnerability. And that, to be quite honest with you, that was a hard lesson for me to learn. It took me a while because I'd been told never to show vulnerability, that vulnerability was weakness as my career grew in automotive. And as I started to understand more about it and started to show more vulnerability, I felt it and I saw it. People became closer to me and wanted to to drive to whatever action or mission or vision that we had for the company, it bonded that team much more closely together. Oh, no, definitely. And for example, 
Previously, your life was your work. And right now, millennials and Gen Zs, they just say it's a work. I, I, I can change if I want. I can go around the corner. So the challenge for executives right now is actually convince people to come and work with you. Previously, you used to interview them and you make the call. That doesn't happen anymore. They're the ones saying like, okay, should I go with this company that maybe doesn't have the values but that has the flexibility? They're the ones deciding if they're going to work with you as a company now. So my interviewing process went from deciding previously to now trying to pitch them the dream and the vision and tell them, guys, this is what we do. This is our culture. This is what we want to achieve. You'll be excellent, an excellent fit. Please come and work for us. Yeah. Right? You remind me of something. Uh, many years ago, I was in marriage guidance counseling. <laughs> and I remember my uh, ex-husband, he said to the marriage guidance counselor, he said, she lives to work and I work to live. And I thought, and it's the first time I'd heard that statement. And I thought, oh, is he right? And of course, at that point, we were in marriage guidance counselor. I'm never going to admit that he was right, <laughs> but he was, <laughs> he was, but I didn't. I didn't know how to think about my life a different way. Again, because of the mold and that's the way that, that we were, right? But now as I get older, I, I love my work. I love what I do, but it's not the only dimension to me. There are other things that I, I love and enjoy doing and I make more time to do that now. And I see millennials and Gen Z, they, they got that. They got that message already. It took me a few decades to figure it out, but they seem to be born with that as an expectation of life. Yeah, they use work towards their advantage to do their passions and, and their dreams, follow their dreams, travel around the world, have the best food, you name it. But as you said, in the past, it was very difficult because everyone needed to follow the orders. This is the traditional model. This is the way we think. This is what we want to do. And it is what it, it is. It, 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 they didn't have any flexibility, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. What is the biggest challenge do you think we're faced with as an industry right now from a leadership perspective? But what's the biggest challenge that we're faced with we're in this massive transformation from ice to bev. What, from your viewpoint, from what you see, what is the biggest challenge? I think there are several challenges that we have right now, even as a region. First of all is I think we're running very fast towards immobility. And now we do have this hydrogen option as well that might be better than immobility, but everyone is trying to get there fast and nobody's thinking about the big picture. Is our grid ready to have all those electrical charging stations? Is the car safe enough or do, do, you, do we just want it to get it out there? And the biggest challenge I think is high-tech talent. We graduate the best engineers in the region, but the majority of them unfortunately go away as as soon as they get, get their title. They go to Chicago, they go to New York, they go to the West. So how do we retain that talent and how do we attract that talent to the region? And, and, and that's what my fellow executives and myself are discussing all the time, how talent, it, it's all about talent, right? And this ties along with what we just discussed. If you don't inspire people, you don't, you don't sell them the dream or the vision, you, you will fail getting that new talent. The transition between ICE and EV also comes with education. Are we teachers, for example, we're shorthanded on teachers right now as, as a region, but are we giving them the tools for them to teach the new generations what the immobility business requires? Mm. In the past, you, you needed welders, for example. Do we need that craftsmanship right now, or do we need more robotics, for example, or more software? Are we are we thinking, there's several pillars, and it's a whole different conversation, but are we thinking what to teach the students for, for them to be successful in this digitalization, e-mobility world that we're aiming towards, too? Yeah, well said. Let's take a turn, shall we? 
Let's go into the personal realm. All right. What do you do? Yeah, get ready. <laughs> yeah. Get ready. Uh. Okay. <laughs> what do you like to do for fun? I like outdoors, all the outdoors activities. I just took uh, last summer a canoe trip on the Asabo River. It was quite a blast. Previous to that one, I, I did the same trip. I flipped on the canoe. It didn't end up pretty well. Um, so also all type of extreme sports I do is snowboarding. So Michigan oh. is very good for this. Uh, I actually broke four ribs one month ago, snowboarding. <laughs> so yeah, I play the ukulele, something very original. I'll say that's little guitar from Hawaii, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I'm a foodie and I, I, I like all, all, all types of food. That's why I like Detroit downtown so much because the offering of food and, and different types of cultural foods they offer, it, it's just great. Yeah, it is. You know, I used to live in the city uh, 30 years ago. <laughs> and I lived in uh, Riverfront Apartments, which is right on the riverfront there. And the city was nowhere near as exciting as it is today. But I, I love the vibe of the city. So now I have to ask you, what's your favorite restaurant in Detroit? It's the Standby Restaurant. It's a nice very Yeah, it's a nice spot on the belt, on that alley. It's hidden. Yeah. It's only for 20 people. Uh, but it, it's very, very cozy environment. And, and the food is just great. This, they have this Asian, Mexican, American fusion of, of, of food. And it's very warming, very welcoming. So you'll, you'll see a door and you open and it's a whole different world down there. So the standby is one of my top uh, restaurants for sure. All right. I'm going to put that on my list. Now, tell me about music. What bands do you like? What do you listen to? You know, I'm very flexible about music. Uh, for example, I just went with my cousins to a Judas Priest um, concert, so heavy ah! metal, and I was rocking and I was doing the whole thing. You know, I I, I was moving my lips. I didn't knew the songs, but I was having fun. Uh, <laughs> but but it, like pop, rock, I'm, I'm I'm open to everything. I don't have like an, a specific. It depends on my mood, I guess. If I'm very happy, I hear reggae music to remind myself about me being in the Caribbean a couple of years ago, or if I'm excited, I, I hear rock music. It, 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 it's, I don't have a particular one, I, I guess. <laughs> What's the last book you read? The last book I read is CEO Excellence. So these consultants from McKinsey <clears throat> interview a lot of famous CEOs and they pick their brains about their challenges, their leadership styles, and I think that book is great. Mm. Favorite podcast? My favorite podcast is yours, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Second favorite podcast? Uh, the Disrupted podcast. Ah, oh, yes. And yeah. and that, that, that goes along with my motto of being disruptive. I, I think Ron Stefanski does, does a very good job um, aiming different industries and picking the, the brain of people that are moving the needle and being disruptors out there. So now that we got a, a little look at the personal side of you and what you like to do for fun, what do you do to bring fun into the culture of Anchor? How, how do you make it fun to work there? Yeah. Excellent question. So, for example, we are launching a bonusly platform, and this everything is about rewards and, and gaming systems nowadays, especially with our generations. And they they want to have badges and titles and trophies and everything. So, something that we're launching it's called bonusly, where you set up your own rewards. You you have your claimable rewards, the ones that are given to you, and the challenges. And in that platform, for example, if you walk 10,000 steps, you claim your Stepmaster reward, you get anchor points, right? If you eat a breadless sandwich twice a week, you get points. If you donate to charity or, or, or volunteer to some something, you get points. And we also use it for recognize uh, the good work of people, managers, and people can translate points between each other. So it's a very dynamic platform that we do have a lot oh. of fun. But also we reward people with concert tickets, for example. And I try to do at least uh, once every two months a company outing. Next outing is going to be in May. We're going to see LaRouche 
the Detroit City Football Club, all of us will be down there having a lot of fun. But we did, I, I do take the culture very seriously. I, I like to say that we work smart, but play hard. We, 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 we like the playing part of it, but because we, we, we work very smart, right? So we, in our new webpage, you'll see we have a lot, a whole new section just for our culture with the pictures. We do pumpkin carving tests, um, gingerbread houses, ugly sweater contests, and Valentine's Day. Today we have St. Patrick's, everyone is wearing green and like leprechauns, uh, antennas. So yeah, we're, we're, we're a very fun company to work with and, and definitely a flagship as some other uh, people have mentioned. There's a lot of CEOs out there that would say that spending money on that is reckless and that it's uh, the perception, you know, is that you've always got to show to your OEM clients that you're on the razor's edge, right? That you're not, you're not just blowing money left and right. And that's one viewpoint. But the other side to that is that you've got to do things that uh, to celebrate your culture and to build a culture. How did you overcome some of that more traditional thinking to bring fun into the workplace? It, it, as you said, it all comes to the budget. So playing with the budget helps, but also trying to convince the board members that this is something that is needed nowadays. I mean, it's not all about work. We also need to bond, not on a work environment. I mean, people want to have beers and, and, and tell stories to, to, to know each other better. You know, so I think it pays off. It's a very well investment, if you want to call it that way. I am very heavily on the culture uh, budget myself. Mm -hmm. I uh, love to hear that. Well, Jose, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. And I wish you an anchor every success. Thank you for your time today. Oh, thank you, Jan. It, it was great. Thanks for having me.